Sean Weijian is one of the first batch of Chinese state-sponsored students sent to the U.S. after the Cultural Revolution. As a high-ranking spy and a white glove for the Chinese Communist Party, Sean is publicly known as the chairman and CEO of Pacific Alliance Group, one of the largest privity investment companies in Asia, which manages over $40 billion funds. Sean was a senior partner of Texas Pacific Investment Group while acting as TPG's consultant also till today, secretly carrying out missions for the Chinese Communist Party. Sean Weijian was interviewed by the Phoenix videos, he said. Sean's descriptions about the peaceful protests in Hong Kong last year, when they opposed the amendment of the fugitive ordinance by Hong Kong's administration, they suffered from violent crackdowns by the CCP's police. Huge number of youths in Hong Kong were arrested, assaulted, and even murdered. After the CCP forced the passage of Hong Kong national security law the citizens took to the streets against the draconian law, but once again was cracked down by the CCP's police. A range of countries strongly condemned the CCP for openly destroy the one country, two systems. The implementation of the national security law meant that journalists, human rights organizations, non-government organizations, and residents of foreign countries can become potential victims of this law. All dissidents can be charged with inciting sedition, with life imprisonment, and maximum penalty. Such draconian law destroys the autonomy of people in Hong Kong directly threatens the democracy and freedom of Hong Kong, and signifies the death of one country, two systems. It forced numerous Hong Kong youngsters to leave their hometown. But Sean reversed the narrative just like the propaganda of the CCP's media. He put the police crackdown on the peaceful demonstration. As riots and violence, and even admired the oppressive law, it was revealed Sean's true identity as the CCP's running dog. Morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to the CCP Reality Check. For tonight's series, we are going to explore into Mr. Mao School's bankruptcy case. But tonight, we are going to mainly doing a review, or we should say a revisit of the bankruptcy case before we put on any updates in our future episodes. So without further ado, let's move on to tonight's episode. So the title is How the CCP Infiltrates the U.S. Judicial System, case number 2250073, Revisited. So before we look into the content of what is happening of the case, we are going to do a recap of the case background. Let's move on to the next slide. OK, let's take a look at the at the relationship diagram here. In this diagram, these are the people who have involved in the CCP's unrestricted lawfare against Mr. Mao's score. As we saw here, some of, the, some of them have already pleaded guilty. Some of them have already been sentenced to jail, including Joe Lo, of whom we have already put him into one of our past episodes. Some of them are facing lawsuits of the United States. So this is the overview of the roadmap. Again, we are focusing on the actions and the facts of what these, the people involved have done during the CCP's unrestricted lawfare 
not concentrating on the people. Because CCP's growing influence to the United States judicial systems represents one of the largest threats to the United States. So we are going to look in further in detail and in particular of the figures who have involved in the, in the CCP's unrestricted lawfare against Mr. Miles Squaw via the bankruptcy case. So let's move on. The first person we are going to do a quick recap on is Luc Adepon. Luc Adepon is the partner of Paul Hastings. But Luc Adepon, because of his identity as the partner of Paul Hastings, making him having an apparent conflict of interest because Paul Hastings has strong connections with the entities affiliated to the CCP and the Paul Hastings has several other connections to other entities and persons who are affiliated to the CCP. Bear in mind, Mr. Mao is not only a dissident, but he is also the number one enemy of the CCP regime. The Paul Hastings has been representing PAG in many cases, and PAG owned PAX, which is called the Pacific Alliance Asia Opportunity Fund. And PAX is the plaintiff of Mr. Mao Squaw's bankruptcy case. So that, law, that really makes Paul Hastings having connections to the CCP via the PAG. To make these to make these things even further or to try to we, as long as we wanted to put an example for our viewers to understand the relationship, we move on to the next one to show the stories which embodied their relationship. The, this is the news back in 2018 that has been published by Law360 website saying that Paul Hastings leading PAG making a 671 million bid for Spring IIT. 671 million is a huge number. So the Paul Hastings during the bankruptcy case is making a claim that they're that trying to wash themselves off from any connections with CCP, which of course CCP has a very strong conflict of interest against Mr. Mao's score. And since PAG is affiliated to the CCP, PAG also has a strong conflict of interest. If Paul Hastings does not have a long history of collaboration with the PAG, how come PAG be brave enough or having that much of trust or confidence to let Paul Hastings let such kind of merger and acquisition case, it's worth $671 million. Be really bear in mind, Mr. Mao already revealed that PAG Wei Jianshan is a top level spy that reported directly to Qi Shang Wang, the CCP's vice president to this day. And this is merely one of the examples of Paul Hastings' connections to the CCP via CCP's affiliated ent entities. As we should see in the next slide, Jinshan Bank, as we saw here, it is a state-controlled or state-controlled bank via huge amount of shares or by people. But let's pay attention to the slide looking at the highlighted areas in the hong kong legal advisor in that part paul hastings look at the hong kong legal advisor part it lists paul hastings as their hong kong legal advisor that basically means if there's any legal issues they have to face in hong kong they will go to host paul hastings to ask to, to ask them to become their counsels 
not only that, there's also a strong another detail makes Paul Hastings related to Bruno Wu, and Bruno Wu is a registered spy in the United States, work for the CCP. Let's move on to see what's going on here. So this is a list of the name of sh the stakeholders or shareholders, as we say. So let's take a look at the highlighted part. The Harvest Fund Management Company Limited is owned by no one other than Bruno Wu. And Bruno Wu has a FARA registration number. The FARA registration number of Bruno Wu is 6611. So now we've, we will moving on to the next slide to take a look at the summary graph. This graph is going to help us to understand how does Paul Hastings linked to the PAG and linked to Bruno Wu, the CCP spy in the United States? So now you may want to ask, David, we have been looking into the background for so much. So what happened in the case number 2250073? We are going to look into the case right now. So let's move on to looking at what happened in case number 2250073. So this case 2250073 is a bankruptcy case filed by, this is the bankruptcy case of Mr. Mao score. It was filed on February 15th, 2022, according to chapter 11, 11 of the bankruptcy code, which is also title 11 of the United States code. That chapter 11 of the bankruptcy act and the case is assigned to judge Julie A. Manning. So we'll continue to take a look at the further development. So according to the chapter 11 of the bankruptcy act, the case 2250073 becomes a bankruptcy case. And we already say, see the, uh, the, the underlined part. It says entered June the 15th, 2022, four months after its initial filing. So we will take a look at the highlighted part here. It says, the highlighted part, the chapter 11 trustees proposed management of the estate and continued administration of the debtor's case. That means at this point, it was pending to appoint a trustee for the bankruptcy case. So let's move on to see what happened. That, I know this is a little bit quick, Originally, it was not Luc Artepon, but we already revealed to you that Luc Artepon has a strong conflict of interest against Mr. Malik Squaw because of his identity as the partner of the Paul Hastings and because of Paul Hastings' ongoing track record of representing CCP's affiliated entities. So, you may want to ask, First, why is the case of this bankruptcy filed? Why? So let's move on to answer that question first, and then we will take a look on why there's something abnormal about the trustee's appointment. Let's take a look. Let's review this. The question here says, how did the 30 million dollar loan become a 280 million pay dollar payment. That is the reason why this bankruptcy case was filed. The reason is listed here already. The judge ordered the ship Lady May. It all started from Lady May. In the one of the past cases, the judge ordered the ship Lady May to be driven to be sent back to New York. And the fine for parking outside of the jurisdiction of New York is $500,000 a day. And 
its tally at 268 days in total. The fines of $134 million plus $30 million plus 120 million. $120 million of Lady May's price tag. And, and the fines of $134 million alone was being ordered by judge to be paid in cash. And such payment has to be made within five business days. Mr. Mao's score had to file a Chapter 11 bankruptcy because of the ruling from the judge. Uh, about the case that making such a fine, we already made, we already mentioned about the case in the past episode. So if you are interested, we will post the link of that episode later at the end of the live stream. But for now, we are going to look into another important question. Why should this bankruptcy case raise our concern over the CCP's infiltration to the United States judicial system. Let's take a look at the first one. So it is the case because of the, what we say, the nomination of the trustee. We will first look into Judge Julie A. Manning's hearing summary to US trustee's office. Judge Manning's commentary is the following. She said either United States trustee office appoints someone or have a vote prior to appoint somebody. And DOJ trustee's office appointed Joe D. Whitley. And the person who is being appointed by the DOJ trustee office said they accepted the appointment. And such appointment, the appointee was found to be without any conflict of interest, nor does he had any kind of con connection of interest with the trust, with the uh, Mr. Miles score. But the U.S. trustee office decided to withdraw the appointment. To clarify that point, we are going to look in, into the next slide. Now, we saw here that Mr. Joe D. Whitley, this is the affidavit of Mr. Joe D. Whitley being appointed as a trustee, and Mr. Joe D. Whitley signed the affidavit. The affidavit was signed on June the 30th. It's much earlier than the date when Luc Ardepont was being, was being appointed Let's take a look at why such appointment was abnormal. You may have this question. So this is the rule, exact rule, of why the appointment of Luc Ardepon was abnormal. The rule says if the court orders the appointment of trustee or an examiner, if a trustee or an examiner dies or resigns during the case or is removed under Section 324 of this title, or if a trustee fails to qualify under Section 322 of this title, then the United States trustee, after consultation with parties in interest, shall appoint subject to court approval one disinterested person other than the United States trustee to serve as a trustee or examiner, as the case may be in the case. Now, we will look into the next slide to see if these, if the so-called appointment or the change of trustee followed the rules or not. As we said here, Mr. Joe D. Whitley is not dead. Two, Mr. Joe Whitley did not resign by himself. What about the third situation you may ask? Does withdrawal count? Withdrawal has to be agreed by both parties and then approved by the court. But the problem is the withdrawal was only initiated by the trustee's office. And Mr. Miles score did not agree, did not agree to the withdrawal. That means it becomes a does not apply situation. So up to this point, you may want to ask, David, 
what we saw here is merely it, there's is something very wrong about the appointment of the of the trustee. But how does that related to the CCP's infiltration of the United States judicial system? That we will put some of the very crucial details and some of the very important questions to be asked, to, uh, not to be asked, I'm sorry, but to be answered in the future to see in what ways can we know that the CCP has been using PAG in executing the unrestricted lawfare against Mr. Moscow. Let's move on. We already saw this part. It may, you may want to say, David, we already saw this part before. Yes, we saw this part before, but, but this is exactly the reason why we have to look into the slide again. Because the fine is tallied, the key point is at the last two bullet points, it says the fines of 134 million must be paid in cash and must be paid within five days. So you may want to ask, David, Mr. Mouse is a, we already know that Mr. Mouse is rich, but the biggest problem is even the, no matter how rich a person can be, collecting 134 million within five business days, it's outside of anyone's ability. It doesn't matter. That forces Mr. Mao's score in the final chapter 11 bankruptcy. And there's also six questions we have to look into before we conclude today's episode. Move on. There are seven questions. Uh, my apologies. We have seven questions to look into. These are very important questions to be, to to say to be remembered or have to be asked when we are looking into the this very abnormal case. The number one question is how a three thirty million dollar case became nearly three hundred million one. So to further clarify that question is because that the PAG via PAX filed a contract, a breach of contract case. Of course, we already, already find out now that contract case is a part of the CCP's unrestricted lawfare. But PAX filed a contract case against Mr. Mouse back in 2017. And that case sh shoot up from a $30 million case to a $300 million case. How does that happen? Number two, is it normal to require Mr. Mao's score to pay off a fine of $134 million within five business days? We already asked the questions and we find that it's really hard to find an answer. Number three, why was the original trustee removed without proper procedure after, after he was sworn in? We already see the, a bit of it in the, in, uh, before we reach this slide, we already saw that he's already sworn in and he already signed the affidavit of being appointed as the trustee. But why? Why he was simply being withdrawn and without consultation of Mr. Miles score? Number four, is Paul Husting LLP really disinterested in this case? Consider, especially considering all those track records of their, their relationship with PAG with PAX, and also with Bruno Wu. How is he really? Is Paul Hosting LP really disinterested in this case? Number five, is this a simple bankruptcy case? Number six, the, the question is related to every one of us. Who is the next Miles? in the sense of who would be the target, the next target of the CCP's unrestricted lawfare. And the last question is, how long will it take to stop the CCP's sabotage of the US judicial system via the unrestricted lawfare? With these seven questions, 
we will be following the case in the future episodes. So now we are going to move on to wrap up today's live stream. The recap of the background. Again, this graph will be appearing in the related theme or the related topic live stream in the future. These are the people who are involved in the CCP's unrestricted lawfare against Mr. Miles Score. Bruno Zheng Wu is the mastermind behind this unrestricted lawfare. We already shared the case of George Higginbotham, Joe Lowe, Nikki Lambrevis, and Edith Brady, who have all pled guilty. We also shared the lawsuits of Pross Michelle and Steve Wynn in the past episodes. Although these two cases are still in progress, we believe the United States judicial system will serve the rule of law. So please stay tuned for the future episodes in this topic. So now before we finally end our live stream, we'll be having a chat reading time as one of the so-called the custom we are reading some of the uh, some of our viewers chat so take a look what they said about the topic tonight sam oh okay we have shamu sam and mickey thank you very much for joining us tonight and thank you very much for participation via the via the chat okay let's take a look it says paul hastings is full of attorneys who play law for the ccp of course, if you're looking into Paul Hastings, of course, if you're looking into Paul Hastings track record of their involvement with the CCP's affiliated entities, it is not hard to conclude or to reach such a conclusion. Also, Sam said USA should seek extradition of Joe Lowe to the United States. Of uh, we hope so, but at this point, saying Oh, by the way, we would like to. I would like to do a quick update on Jolo's case. Jolo it is being sent to jail because of his contempt, because of contempt of court. Of course, we hope that he could be, as I say, he could be extradited to the United States because Jolo is indeed involved in the CCP's unrestricted lawfare against Mr. Mouskor. Okay, that's the end of today's chat. This streams chat reading session and again thanks for joining me tonight i am david starwatcher your host from washington dc farm of the new federal state of china i'll be seeing you next time in the future episodes stay tuned and i wish you all have a good night <laughs>